Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, virtual seminars for Precambrian Geology again. We, um, we're headed into uh, the fall quarter of the year. <clears throat> so we've started school out here. Hopefully it's going well so far. Hopefully it's going well for everybody else. Um, today we're excited to have Dr. Eric Sperling with a couple of graduate students who are working with him to present on um, a new sort of data comp compilation project. Their title is Using Bigger Data to Eliminate Earth to Illuminate Earth History, the Sedimentary Geochemistry and Paleoenvironments Project. Um, next week, we're going to have a presentation by uh, Clara Buckles at Caltech. Um, that title titled, or that talk is titled Linking the Surface and Igneous Sulfur Isotope Record Across the Great Oxidation Event. So definitely join for Dr. Claire Buckles next week. Um, the week following that one, we're not going to have anybody presenting because many of us will be at GSA um, in Portland, Oregon. Hopefully I'll get to see some of you there. Um, but so that's, that's just, that's it for announcements. Um, the talk should go as, as usual, except that we'll have three speakers, the, but the time that they present should total around 45 minutes. And then at the end, we'll have a question session. You can all ask your questions either by typing to the chat or raising your hand virtually. And I'll try my best to get everybody in the order that, that they requested to ask a question. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to introduce our speakers. So Dr. Eric Sperling focuses his research on earth history and the evolution of life and the interactions between the biosphere and the geosphere. That one I took from his website. But uh, his talk today will be focusing on sedimentary geochemistry and paleoenvironments project, which works to compile geochemical data for implementing analysis from a big data perspective. His, he received his bachelor's degree and master's from and a master's from Stanford with Dr. James Engel. His thesis was titled Defining the Permian Triassic Boundary in the Western United States. He went on to Yale for a master's and PhD, where he completed that he, which he completed in 2010 on molecular paleobiology and early animal evolution with Dr. Derek Briggs. Since receiving his PhD, Eric held postdoctoral positions at Harvard, funded by the Aguron Institute and NASA and at Scripps before starting at Stanford, where he's currently assistant professor and center fellow. Presenting with him today on practical applications of the SGP project are Alex Lipp, who is a graduate student at Imperial College London, and Richard Stock Stocky, who is a graduate student at Stanford with Eric. So with that, please, uh, please go on, Eric, and, and get us started. Okay, great. Uh, it is great to see everyone here, uh, including a number of people in the SGP project already. Um, I'd really like to thank the, the organizers, Alex and Andre. Uh, for me, this virtual Precambrian series has been, uh, I'd say, one of the intellectual highlights of the, uh, of the pandemic. And so I'd really like to thank them for, for all their hard work um, in putting this together. Uh, so today's seminar, uh, as Alex mentioned, is going to be a little bit different format. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, this open collaborative research consortium that we've started, the uh, Sedimentary Geochemistry and Paleoenvironments Project, or SGP, uh, talk a little bit about why we started the project, uh, and and uh, our first data product and how, how you can access that. Uh, then I know that not everyone wants to listen to an entire talk on data management and data accession. Uh, and so we're gonna switch over uh, and have a couple talks by Rich Stocky and Alex Lipp uh, on actual analyses of these, of these data products and some of the implications for Precambrian history. Uh, and then I'll come back and explain uh, how you can join the project if you're interested, which, which I really hope you will be. Um, and also where we're, where we're going for the future. All right, so uh, in telling the story of, of Earth history, of course, of which 85% uh, is Precambrian Earth history, the big challenge is how we tell this story over billions of years of time scale, uh, billions of years of, of history. And of course, all of this history over billions of years has to start with individual rocks, individual stratigraphic sections, and individual formations. 
This photo here is from my field area up in Northwestern Canada. It's specifically the Ediacaran stratigraphic succession in the Wernicke Mountains of, of uh, Yukon. And I feel really lucky to work here because it has just such an outstanding Neoproterozoic succession. More recently, I've been working up section. Uh, this is a project with uh, Justin Strauss at Dartmouth College and Tiffany Frazier at Yukon Geological Survey, looking at the, the Paleozoic Road River group as exposed on the, on the Peel River. And this is really the most spectacular stratigraphic section I've, I've ever worked on in my life. So I'll just show uh, a little shot from the helicopter here. This is looking down on the Peel River at the lower Ordovicians uh, part of the succession, just beautifully exposed black shales and carbonates uh, all along the river. And what's really uh, spectacular about this section is you can start down in the upper Cambrian and walk and walk and walk and walk and walk. And eventually you'll get all the way up to the middle Devonian. So 120 million years of earth history, all in the same facies, deep water facies, and with very few breaks in stratigraphic section. But of course, all good things must come to an end. And eventually as we get higher up into the Devonian, the paleogeography changes. And so we go from this the situation where we have these isolated carbonate platforms with these deep shale basins to start being covered by coarse clastics from the initiation of a foreland basin. And so even in this most spectacular stratigraphic section I've ever worked in, eventually you're going to have to jump somewhere else in the world in order to keep studying, say, the shale or the carbonate records. And so that's kind of the first hard fact we have to, we have to face when we're, we're talking about billions of years of Earth history. At some point, this stops being a regional geology exercise or a stratigraphic exercise and starts being a data compilation and analysis exercise. The second fact that we have to, have to address is that as we go to all these places around the world, not all rocks are equal. And unfortunately, they're often unequal in very different ways. I've never seen something that I would call the perfect single sample. The fact that all rocks are not equal can be easily and visually demonstrated by some samples from my grad student, Sam Ritzer's uh, doctoral work. And she's been working here on the, the Permian Wolf Camp Shale from Texas. And you can easily see that the core samples are these nice black organic carbon and pyrite rich shales where the uplifted samples uh, are these tan brown colors, of course, because they've been oxidatively weathered. And if we were to include these samples in a database analysis, we would never want to include them both on an equal footing if we were looking uh, uh, at, say, the reduced components of the rock. And in order to do this, we need simple facts about the samples, say, whether they're from core or outcrop, coded into our data matrix. Or put differently, what we need to be, what we need to be asking in terms of these, of these database analyses are what are the biases that affect our given geochemical proxy and how can we code them and either remove the undesirable samples from analysis or account for these different biases in statistical analyses. And so not only do we need our sample and age and our geochemical proxy, but we need a whole host of accessory geochemical data and other geological context data so we can correctly interpret these data from all over the world. Unfortunately, that data product uh, doesn't really exist for our field uh, or didn't um, in, the, in, the, last, in the, the recent history. And so in thinking about how we can get this data product together, I think it's worthwhile to take a look at other fields and how they've solved this problem of central data aggregation and analysis. So what are the different uh, incentives or punishments or, or carrots and sticks that can get busy academic researchers to take time to put their data into databases? So if you were to look, say, at modern biodiversity studies or, or ecological studies, they've actually kind of outsourced this from the ac academics. And really here, the natural, natural history museums have taken the lead. And these are institutions that are, of course, very good at, at managing and compiling large amounts of, of specimens and data. Um, and they kind of took the, the individual initiative or the initiative, uh, and they had the, the personnel and financial resources to do this, to build the data products up until uh, everyone was really excited about them and they, they started to snowball. Uh, a second approach might be thought of as, as kind of the hard stick method. Um, so some of you know that I spent uh, five years of my PhD doing nothing but, but molecular biology. And in molecular biology, you simply cannot publish a paper unless you come to the journal 
with your GenBank accession numbers, the central database for the field. So you can look here in my 2009 Molecular Biology and Evolution paper, uh, and you see this line, new sentences are submitted to GenBank under accession numbers, GQ, blah, 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 blah. And this kind of hard stick method uh, is difficult to set up because of course you have to get uh, every single journal to, to agree to it. But once it is set up, it works really well because uh, having the, the data accession is, is simply the price of admission in order to publish. And so uh, everyone does it. Uh, geology and, and specifically ge sedimentary geochemistry has made, uh, I'd say some progress over the, the last few years in terms of data management and data accession. Uh, we're getting better, um, but we're still nowhere near this kind of hard stick approach. Uh, in fact, I'd say uh, it's a little bit more like a, perhaps a wet noodle. Um, and so you can see here, there's a, a thing from January, 2016, uh, AGU publication recommends the use of uh, IGSNs or international geo sample numbers. Um, and while this is a great recommendation, uh, I think we've reached the point where we can, can answer the question of will sedimentary geochemists catalog new data simply because it is uh, encouraged or recommended. Um, the answer appears to be no. Uh, and this is even more true for, for previously published data. So there's essentially no one in our field that's going back to papers that were published uh, five or 10 or 15 years ago and putting them into databases uh, with no external stimuli. Um, and I'm not trying to make any sort of value judgment here or call anyone out. Certainly uh, before we started SGP, I had an accession in any of my geochemical data. Uh, I raise this because this is simply the tradition of our field and it's where we're at. It's something we have to address in terms of getting all of our data into a central repository is that we don't have a, a history of data accession as a, a normal part of, uh, of, the, of the scientific process in, in sedimentary geochemistry uh, and earth history. Hopefully it will be someday, but we're not there yet. So if we take that kind of as fact, uh, the question is, is how can we actually get this together? And for us, uh, we thought we would focus less on the, on the stick and more on the carrot or in the incentive. And here, uh, we actually tried to, to take a page from the, from the playbook of, of biome uh, biomedical um, or medicine. Uh, and in these fields, uh, there's a really long history of groups coming together into research consortia to centrally aggregate and analyze their data. Uh, and this has been proven as a pretty viable path in, in order to accomplish these goals. Uh, the intellectual carrot uh, is that most scientists, most academics, want more papers on their CV. They want to be part of an intellectual community. Uh, and so they want to be part of this process. And so by making uh, the data accession part of kind of the requirement to join um, the research consortium, you can accomplish both great team science, which I'll, I'll show in a few slides, um, but also make all of the data and context information uh, ultimately publicly available. So uh, as I said, these research consortia are, are really common in biomedical sciences. Um, I just took this one down off the web as an example. Uh, Impact International Mission for Prognosis and Analysis of Clinical Trials in Traumatic Brain Injury. Um, seems a little, a little niche to me, but has more than 60 publications to date. Uh, the one that I'm particularly uh, familiar with is the, the PGC or, or Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. Um, and I'm particularly uh, familiar with this because my wife uh, is, was formerly an analyst and now is a working group leadership in PGC. And so uh, I've been able to watch uh, the great team science that has come out of their collaborative efforts. Uh, and so I just wanted to, to take a brief moment to, to illustrate this because I think it has some good lessons for the, the power of team science and, and this approach. So the goal of PGC is to understand uh, the underlying genetic causes of, of complex uh, psychiatric diseases like schizophrenia. Unfortunately, schizophrenia uh, isn't something like Huntington's disease, disease that has one single genetic locus that controls it. Rather, it's something like height. There's probably hundreds of places in the genome that control your risk of getting schizophrenia. Unfortunately, because each of these individual genetic loci has such a small effect size, this means that you need thousands and thousands of samples in order to say that any specific locus is statistically correlated with schizophrenia. So what PGC did was they got all of the research together, all the researchers together, they got all of them to contribute their data, 
And they published their first group publication with all of the people that contributed the data as co-authors. Uh, this plot here is from that. It's called a Manhattan plot. These show basically all of the points on the genome uh, along this axis. And in order for a, a locus to be, uh, in, to be statistically associated with, with schizophrenia, it has to go across this red line. And what's interesting is that after all of this work by the consortium, 7,000 samples, they were actually weren't able to say that any of the loci were associated with schizophrenia. But they kept working, they kept building their database, they, they tripled the amount of data that was available through the hard work of their members, and they were able to identify the first five loci uh, that were associated with schizophrenia. Kept building their database, 36 loci, more data up to 71 loci, and they're up to, to a bunch more than that now, and they're actually able to start connecting these places in the genome with biology and ultimately with patient care. What I think is important in this discussion, though, is to go back to this figure, where they were in 2009, when they had 7,000 samples. And the key thing here is that each lab, when they do a study, only involves, say, 50 or 100 or a couple hundred people. Uh, and so what this means is that no single lab, and, and basically, you know, with 7,000 samples, they weren't able to, to say anything. Uh, and so kind of the, the take-home message here is that no single lab, no single research group, can ever understand or really illuminate the picture of the genetic basis uh, of schizophrenia. It really takes the whole community to come together and aggregate their data. And although there aren't kind of perfect parallels with, with sedimentary geochemistry and earth history, um, I think this does have some lessons. And that I, I would say that you know, no one individual research group, no one individual stratigraphic section is ever going to tell us across about earth history across these really long timescales. And it really is going to involve, I think, the aggregation of all our community's data and then analysis, sophisticated analysis of that data in order to get the, the full story. So in 2015, we started the SGP uh, modeled after these biomedical consortia. Um, the leadership team of, of SGP involves uh, Dr. Una Farrell at Trinity College Dublin, who um, coordinates data management and built our, our custom database. Uh, Dave Johnson at Harvard, Noah Planowski at Yale, and Kim Lau at Penn State. However, the, the real heroes in all this uh, are the SGP collaborative team, all of the people who you can see their, their names listed here, uh, that have been involved in getting their data into the database and then analyzing um, that first data product. It wouldn't be possible without them. Uh, and of course, their, rec their, uh, their input is, is recognized by authorship on our, on our group publications. Um, so we finished our first data freeze in, in August 2019, and we've been uh, analyzing that. Um, some of the publications from that have been published. Uh, Alex's, for instance, that he'll be talking about today uh, has been published. Uh, Rich's that he'll be talking about is, is still in the process of, of coming out. Um, our data product uh, includes data from all over the world, but mainly North America, Europe, Australia, and China. One of the goals of, of phase two is to, to really get data from all over the world. And so if you're watching this video and, and are um, from a country outside these areas or work outside these areas, we'd love to get you involved. Um, the data involves kind of three different uh, types of data. There's direct entry by, by SGP team members or, or direct coding by SGP team members, um, as well as entry from uh, uh, two large USGS data resources the National uh, Geochemical Database, ROC, uh, and the Critical Metals in, in Black Shale Project. Uh, the, the data product includes um, more than 82,578 samples, um, all with detailed geological context information. Um, I don't think Rich uh, is necessarily going to have time to show this, uh, but we can show statistically that things like core versus outcrop, depositional environment, basin type, uh, metamorphic grade, all of these geological context variables that we've put in uh, actually have strong statistical power uh, in, our, in our overall results. And so this is something that's, that's never before been available. Um, the data product also uh, uh, includes um, over 2.7 million uh, individual analytes uh, or geochemical analyses, um, again, all with, with de detailed geological context information. Um, I'm asked lots of times uh, whether this represents big data. Uh, it actually isn't. The definition of, of big data has to do with 
data sets that are so large that they require new ways to either analyze or, or store them. Uh, our data uh, is relatively big compared to, to our field, um, but, but fits pretty well in a custom Postgres database. And so uh, I like the phrase bigger data to, to describe what we're, what we're doing. Um, our phase one data product, uh, we've primarily focused on shale and mudrock, which is uh, kind of um, the lithology that, that some of the founding members uh, primarily worked on. So you can look here, uh, the SGP direct entry, all of this are, are fine grain plastics and most of the USGS critical metals and black shale data are as well. Uh, and it's primarily focused on, on the Neoproterozoic and Paleozoic, which was uh, kind of the goal of our phase one as we were getting this consortium off the ground. Uh, and so, um, you know, if you, if you consider these plots together, uh, we do have data throughout Earth history, and we do have a lot of different lithologies in the database, um, but, but kind of the bulk of the data, uh, especially with complete context information and methods information, is going to be from the Neoproterozoic and, and Paleozoic and particularly that shale record. Um, this phase one data product is now uh, openly and publicly available via our um, API or search website, which is at sgp-search.io. Um, I've been really happy with, with how, this data, how this website has, has developed, although I can't really uh, take, any, take any credit for it. Um, in the interest of time, uh, if I can pull, pull this up, All right, there we go. Uh, I was gonna show show how the show how the website works, but actually, in the interest of time, uh, I'm gonna just direct you to a tutorial that we've developed um, through the link in the Zoom chat uh, that nicely explains how the how the website is organized. Uh, as I said, this, this data is, is openly available. Um, all that we ask is that if you use this, um, you cite the Feral et al. 2021 Geobiology Manuscript um, as the source for the, for the data and the compilation. All right, so I'm sure that's uh, enough on, on data management and so forth. We're gonna jump into the analyses. Uh, I just wanted to, to share a little bit about how uh, I've tried to approach these analyses in our lab. Um, in thinking about this, uh, I've been uh, kind of inspired, uh, particularly by paleobiological studies, which, which probably uh, won't surprise people given that I, I primarily consider myself a, a paleontologist. Um, but basically, I think that paleontologists have done an outstanding job of recognizing that they're working with a, a biased geological and paleontological record. And so the, the kind of main focus of studies that are, that are trying to do things like this, trying to understand the history of diversity of life on earth through time, is to, to try to see through that bias in the record uh, and work back to what the original signal is. And this is uh, kind of as I was alluding to in that, that slide describing the fact that not all samples or no sample is equal, uh, is, is um, this is kind of how I think we should be approaching these large data compilations and analyses in terms of sedimentary geochemical data. Um, in terms of, of uh, pulling out some of these biases, one of the biggest we face in the, in the geological record uh, is clumped um, spatial and temporal sampling. And in this respect, I, I really uh, would like to highlight a paper that was ahead of its time uh, in terms of this uh, with respect to the igneous geochemical record. Um, this nice paper by, by Keller and Shaney in 2012, looking at the evolution of, of felsic lithologies through time, um, and the, the reweighted bootstrap analysis that they, uh, that they developed in order to, to account for spatial and temporal sampling biases. Uh, and Rich will be showing, a, showing um, some analyses using that same method. So with that, uh, I'm gonna let, the, uh, let, let Rich and Alex have at it. Awesome, thanks, Eric. Um, I'm just gonna... No, sorry, my whole screen layout changed for a minute. Um, can everyone see and hear me? Yep, you're good. Awesome, thanks. Okay, so hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm gonna talk about some work that we've been doing 
using SGP data to examine changes in atmospheric oxygen and marine productivity through the Neoproterozoic and Paleozoic. Um, so many of you will be familiar with this reconstruction of atmospheric oxygen over Earth history. Um, today, I'd specifically like to address this second increase in that's commonly reconstructed in the late Neoproterozoic, the so-called Neoproterozoic oxygenation event. Um, and our best evidence for a stepwise Neoproterozoic oxygenation event arguably comes from the trace matter record. Um, and as you can see from these compilations of uranium and molybdenum concentrations in black shales compiled by Camille Partan, Ty Stahl and colleagues, we see a major step change in the concentrations of these metals around the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary. Um, and just to review the premise of these proxies, in the modern, we observe markedly higher trace metal burial rates in anoxic marine environments than we do in oxygenated ones. And this leads to the prediction that in poorly oxygenated ancient oceans with larger extents of marine anoxia, we would have lower marine trace metal concentrations. So based on this, the increase we see in trace metal concentrations around the Neoproterozoic Paleozoic boundary would suggest increased ocean oxygenation. Um, critically for this study, there are a number of limitations to using raw compilations of trace metal concentrations and this kind of simple mass balance approach to reconstructing ocean oxygenation in deep time. Firstly, Trace model burial rates also vary between different anoxic environments, and we see that clearly in the modern, which highlights the value of accounting for things like depositional setting based upon geologic context. Secondly, most of our modern analogues for ancient anoxic environments are euxinic, so they're anoxic with abundant free hydrogen sulfide. And geochemical evidence increasingly indicates that most neoproterozoic and paleozoic anoxic environments were ferruginous or anoxic with abun without abundant free hydrogen sulfide. So throughout this talk, I'm going to be using the term ferruginous to broadly re refer to sort of, to broadly um, reducing low oxygen settings without free hydrogen sulfide based on the sensitivities of the proxies that we use to um, identify them. Um, and critically, we expect these ferruginous environments to have high trace metal burial rates like eutonic environments, but not necessarily as high as we observe um, in modern environments, more like the kind of trace model burial rates we observe in modern suboxic environments. Finally, we <clears throat> observe in the modern that um, trace model burial rates correlate strongly with organic carbon burial rates. Um, um, these interactions between the trace model, trace model cycling and organic carbon cycling lead to some complicated interactions um, between proxy records, ocean atmosphere oxygenation, and marine productivity. So a local or regional scale, increased organic carbon burial leads to increased trace model burial. It also leads to increased oxygen utilization and tends to decrease the amount of dissolved oxygen we have in the water column. A global scale on geologic timescales, increased organic carbon burial actually leads to increased atmospheric oxygenation. In this project, we've revisited the trace model organic carbon records using SGP data with the specific aim of understanding the histories of um, oxygenation and productivity in life of these complications. Um, so for this project, we begin by revisiting raw data compilations um, using the large data sets available with SGP um, and trying to account for, for spatial and temporal biases in that data, as Eric was mentioning. We next focus on trying to deconvolve representative biogeochemical signals from these data independent of the proxy interrelationships and sampling biases using statistical learning techniques. And finally, we use a combined biogeochemical modeling approach to evaluate whether these, what these deconvolved records mean for neoproterozoic, paleozoic, atmosphere oxygenation and productivity. Um, so for part one, we ask, are SGP data consistent with previous compilations when spatial and temporal sampling biases are accounted for? Um, and here, as you can see from this map of SGP data, black shells are sampled unevenly in space and time. Um, and to kind of try and tackle that, we use the spatiotemporal bootstrapping approach um, from Brennan Keller and Akshay Mira's work um, to inversely weight samples based on their proximity to others in space and time. Um, and then we produce resampled distributions um, of, of the raw data to try to try and get at more representative trends through time, accommodating those biases. Um, 
So here we present those resampled distributions as box plots from the and uranium concentrations, up here for the proportion of eucinic samples based on ion speciation, and for total organic carbon. And in each case, the sample sets used are filtered based upon existing conventions. So we use eucinic samples from libidone, anoxic samples for uranium, anoxic samples with ion speciation for proportion eucinic, and all shell for TOC. Um, if we look at that data, we see some interesting trends. So for both molybdenum and uranium, we do see a step change around the Ediacara and Cambrian boundary, but concentrations then go back down again and don't increase until the Devonian. Um, kind of corroborating evidence from, from other studies, we see that the majority of samples through the Paleozoic are ferruginous until we reach the Devonian, with the exception of this late Ediacaran um, data point here. And then we see the TOC record, an increase in TOC around the Ediacara and Cambrian boundary, followed by further increases through the Paleozoic. Um, but again, those are just raw records, and here we specifically want to address the question of how proxy records vary through time independently of their interrelationships and geological sampling biases. And this includes accommodating for environmental contexts such as depositional environment and local redox. It also includes things like correlations between trace metal proxies and organic carbon. Um, our approach here to generating deconvolved biogeochemical signals employs a statistical learning approach called random forests. And random forests are built on the principle of regression trees, where we recursively partition data sets based upon key variables in of interest. And a great thing for geologists is that, is that regression trees can take both categorical and continuous data. Um, the kind of problem with regression trees is that they have high variance, so they're prone to overfitting and it makes it difficult to infer meaningful statistical relationships. So what we do here is employ random forests, which build a sort of a forest of trees and minimize these issues with bootstrapping and split variable randomization. Um, and the particularly appealing thing about random forests is that they enable us to generate partial dependence plots, which show the marginal effect of a variable of interest on the predicted outcome of a random forest model. So to read my example here, we could ask, what is the marginal effect of geologic time on molybdenum concentrations if all other variables are held constant? And the results I'll show on the next slide are partial dependence plots. Um, the only difference is that instead of the line I show here, they use envelopes to illustrate the effects of age uncertainty and samples with partial context data. Um, so here are those plots that are sort of deconvolved by geochemical signals, where each proxy is given a different statistical treatment based upon what we know about its biogeochemical behavior um, to generate representative marine signals independent of proxy interrelationships and sampling. These records are intended to capture trends at long time scales, so we therefore shouldn't necessarily be expecting them to capture transient events like neoproterozoic carbon cycle perturbations. Um, as you can see, our deconvolved trace model records remain low and constant through most of the neoproterozoic. They then exhibit a moderate transient increase around the Ediacara and Cambrian boundary before falling back down to near neoproterozoic levels. Deconvolved molybdenum and uranium records then increase dramatically in the Silurian and Devonian, particularly in the Devonian. Um, in contrast to those transient increases that we see around the Ediacara and Cambrian boundary in the trace metal records, we do see a major step change in total organic carbon around the Ediacara and Cambrian boundary that's then followed by a series of increases through the mid to late Paleozoic. Um, so now that we have those deconvolved records, I just want to take a minute to ask what these analyses mean for neoproterozoic, paleozoic ocean atmosphere oxygenation and productivity. Um, and to do that, we've used a combined biogeochemical modeling approach um, interfacing three different biogeochemical models. So firstly, we use CGNI to generate 3D ocean realizations at different atmospheric oxygen and marine productivity levels as parameterized by marine phosphate. And then we compute the predicted extent of anoxia and suboxia from those model oceans. I combine those model results with a, a trace metal mass balance um, for molybdenum and uranium, and incorporate both anoxic and suboxic settings with suboxic environments broadly parameterized to correspond to ferruginous settings in my previous slides. And we then generated estimated seawater molybdenum and uranium values for each of those productivity and oxygen scenarios. Finally, we use the CANOPS biogeochemical model 
to provide associated organic common burial fluxes for each of those scenarios. Um, that I should highlight this is mainly based on an awesome paper that's currently in review by Devon Cole. Um, and using that CanOps model, we also identify stable O2 and productivity states um, on geologic timescales. So first, I'd like to highlight the Eugenia results. These are shown as heat maps with atmospheric oxygen logarithmically scaled on the x-axis from 1% to 100% of modern atmospheric levels, and marine phosphate schedule, um, scaled similarly on the y-axis. The key thing I'd like to draw your eye to here is that for most of these scenarios, the majority of the seafloor is covered by some combination of suboxic and anoxic water masses, and only at near modern oxygen productivity levels do we see the majority of oxygen, uh, the majority of bottom waters being well oxygenated. If we then take the CGNI results, molybdenum uranium mass balance, and results from Devon Cole's CanOps work, we can estimate seawater trace model concentrations and organic carbon burial rates for each of these atmospheric oxygen and marine productivity scenarios. So here I'm showing those results on similar heat maps with logarithmic oxygen productivity axes. Um, notably, I should highlight that these do reproduce modern values for this 100% modern productivity in oxygen cell. Um, they also illustrate different sensitivities in the, in the concentrations of trace models in seawater versus organic carbon burial rates at different oxygen productivity levels. Um, now, when we return to our deconvolved biogeochemical records, they illustrate that in the neoproterozoic, we require a change in our system straight that drives a major shift in organic carbon burial rates, but limited to no change in marine trace metals. In the late Paleozoic, on the other hand, we require a change that uh, a change in our system state that drives a major shift in both trace metals and organic carbon burial rates. Um, this leads us to delineate three broad phases of neoproterozoic paleozoic oxygen productivity. First, we have low organic carbon, low trace metals, low atmospheric oxygen and productivity. And a second sort of moderate oxygen productivity state where we have higher total organic carbon burial rates, but still low trace metals because the majority of the global seafloor is covered by reducing bottom waters. And then a third phase with approximately modern TOC trace metals, atmospheric O2 and productivity. So, I know it's a lot to cover in, in a short talk, but um, I just want to recap our results here. Um, so to conclude, oxygen levels did not increase to modern levels in the late Neoproterozoic based on our analyses, and more likely rose to approximately modern levels in the Devonian. Suboxic water masses were likely much more extensive in early Paleozoic oceans than the modern ocean, whereas later Paleozoic oceans were likely characterized by widespread oxygenation and extremely reducing RMZs. Marine productivity and atmospheric oxygen therefore likely increased together in multiple steps through the Ediacaran and Devonian. And our combined statistical learning analyses point towards at least three broad O2 productivity states for the Neoproterozoic Paleozoic Earth system. Um, and then with that, I should stop sharing and pass over to Alex. And I appreciate any questions after he, him and Eric are done. So, cool. Thank you, uh, Rich. Okay, I will try and share screen. I'm gonna assume that's working well. So if it's not, just give me a shout. I'll happily change it. Uh, so, brilliant. Oh, thanks, Alex. Uh, thanks everyone for um, coming to listen to us all. So I'm gonna be presenting about something uh, like a very different use of the FGP data set. So while um, Rich has been focusing on sort of secondary diagenetic effects, which we can pick up in aggregate in the sedimentary record. I'm instead focusing on what I see as the primary geochemical signal within sediments, i.e. that of their source region, their provenance, and then their original alteration uh, in transit from the continents onto the earth, and then how we can use that and the record stored within databases like FTP to reconstruct the changes to earth history over time. So. To me, Alex, yeah. before you get too far in, there's something at the top of your screen that's covering uh, part of your. Yeah, I don't I, know if that can be I'll, put away. I'll try and get rid of that. Is it gone? Okay, cool. Good. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, so 
One question which I've been thinking about a lot is the, the composition of the Earth's crust through time. So this is a, a really uh, quite a hotly contested uh, question. So just over the last few years, there's you know, a whole bunch of high profile papers come out um, fairly often, some arguing for quite a mafic crust. So that's generally sort of um, the paper by uh, Chen et al um, at the top here, but others more recently. So Nick, Nicholas Dilfar's group in Chicago are arguing instead that the Earth day early crust was in fact quite evolved. So it's quite a hotly contested uh, question, even though it's pretty fundamental for understanding the early history of the Earth, in particular, when plate tectonics may have evolved. So what I'm trained, what I've been working on is how we can bring large databases like FGP and new statistical analyses to bring the sedimentary record to bear on this question. Uh, and the FGP really is uh, a novel gateway to addressing this question. And I think I kind of think doorway is the best way about it because often when we're when analyses like this using the sedimentary record to understand uh, surface through time, the the compilation produced are often kind of ad hoc, um, and it's there's no sort of one go to resource where we can all bring the same data to bear on the same questions. So I see FGP is a real step changer in that there's this one sort of um, authoritative resource which just represents the sedimentary geochemical record. Um, but even though we have this uh, great new data resource, we still need better ways to analyze the sedimentary ge geochemical record. So as part of uh, my PhD, I've been trying to resolve that. So sedimentary geochemistry is kind of complex. So firstly, we have the signal from the igneous protolith from which sediments ultimately derive. They're uh, modified by erosional processes and then secondary effects like sorting uh, and chemical weathering also had a naturally a high impact on the chemistry, the geochemistry. And we're also now beginning to see strong evidence that cation exchange is a fairly universal impactor on sedimentary geochemistry. So that's work by people like uh, Ed Tipper. So all of these dif different myriad processes combine to affect the ultimate uh, elemental composition of sediments just represented down at the bottom as just this list, list of elements. And ultimately, our goal as sedimentary geochemists is to try and take that uh, elemental data and reconstruct these uh, processes uh, which have formed it from. This is complex. So um, the, 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 effectively, effectively, this is an ongoing challenge. So through my PhD, I've developed a model for how we can try and understand the sedimentary geochemistry uh, sedimentary geochemistry. So the model which we went for is ultimately effectively just a simple linear vector addition model. And the justification for this, I don't really have enough time to show you, unfortunately, but effectively we took a, uh, a medium-sized compilation of separate data, so independent of FGP, and by performing some multivariate analyses, we can really reduce the major element by which I'm talking about silicon, aluminium, magnesium, etc. Uh, down to a very small number of dimensions. And by exploring the orientation of those directions, we can see that actually we can take a fairly high dimensional elemental data set and simplify it into a small number of more significant processes. So what we're going to consider is we have a sediment composition, which we're just going to represent as a vector X here. Uh, so that'd be silicon, weight percent, magnesium, weight percent, et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm going to propose that the, upper con the composition of the upper continental crust rep represents a good starting point to describe sediment compositions generally. But we need to take into account that there is going to be some variability according to changes in igneous rock composition. So this here we represent as like a vector P and some protolith term psi, where we can change the composition according to moving along some array of igneous rock compositions. And then we have to take into account that, uh, that rocks are weathered by chemical weathering, which will alter their composition too. So we're gonna represent that as motion along some compositional trend indicated by weathering. And the omega term here represents how intense that is. And naturally we consider some error that this model is not gonna be perfect. So uh, this model effectively means that we can describe any sediment which may exist in terms of just two processes. So we're projecting sedimentary compositions onto a 2D plane, which represents, which has uh, coordinates according to their protolith composition and their weathering intensity. So 
that's kind of black box and I appreciate that may not be totally convincing but for now we'll just take it on trust and try and understand what that actually means if we had sedimentary geochemical data. So this figure here shows um, a, a 2D plane. On the x-axis we have weathering intensity and on the y-axis we have sediment protolith. So what we do is we just project elemental compositions onto this 2D plane uh, by which they can be described in terms of their processes. So the cross here at the origin represents the composition of the upper continental crust. And the motion from left to right is just increasing our weathering intensity. And the motion vertically is changing the composition of our protolith. So up is felsic and down is mafic. And this is represented by the contours of elemental concentrations here. So red is silicon, which we can see go from high to low as we get more mafic. And then contours of calcium, which get from high to low as we increase weathering. So any sedimentary composition can be described in terms of these geological processes. Now, why is that? What I'm going to show now is how we can use this to understand the changing composition of the crust. So what I'm applying here is the model where we're interested in this, this term here, the protolith term, uh, and psi in particular is the intensity of the igneous rock protolith. So up is felsic and down is mafic. Now these gray po points represent data within the sedimentary geochemical paleoenvironment paleo project. So the data we're using are the major elements, and then we're using the model age, which has been independently assigned, to place it in the sedimentary record. I'm also using the lithology metadata to filter out samples which, were, which we don't want to include in this analysis, notably carbonate samples, which will be uh, biasing our results in terms of weather intensity. And then we also supplement this data with other literature data from the, the very early Earth as the initial phase of FGP didn't focus on this time period. In total, we have around 14,000 data points from around Earth history, which we can estimate the composition of their protolith with this uh, uh, coefficient psi. So what I want to draw your attention to is that the um, Archean sediments have a significantly more mafic, on average, protolith than more recent sediments. And in fact, from about 2.5 billion years onwards, the, composite, the average composition of sediments uh, through time has stayed largely constant and similar to that to present day. So we see this long-term stability of the average concentration uh, composition. These black uh, circles just represent the average composition, uh, the average uh, psi coefficient within each uh, 500 million year age bin. And these just represent one sigma. But the key observation is that in the Archean, it was more mafic. But we can actually do slightly better than just saying it was more mafic. So a key um, application of this, the approach which I developed, is that we can actually undo the compositional effect of weathering to get at the full composition of a sediment protolith. So if this black dot represents a generic um, sediment sample, what we can do is we can just project it back along this weathering vector to the igneous rock array represented by uh, green samples here. So this is the, pro the sediment, this is the protolith, and this is just the action of unweathering. So what we can do is then we can calculate not just if the Archean protolith were more matrix or not, but we can actually calculate their full elemental composition. And this is what's represented here. So this blue sample here represents the reconstructed uh, protolith for Archean sediments projected onto a uh, total alkaline silica plot, which is just a standard igneous rock classification diagram I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. And then over here, these other points represent the, pro the average protolith for all the other, the other time periods in Earth history, with a big X here being an independent data point, which is the present day composition of the average con upper continental crust. As you can see, two and a half billion years and older represents kind of an outlier from this main cluster. And it is slightly more mafic. But notably, it's actually not that much more mafic. We're still talking a pretty high silica, weight percent silica rock. It's certainly not a basalt. So that's, I think, fairly key because we have this sort of paradigm often that the Archean crust is this sort of feel of the basalt. But in fact, actually, it's still, whilst it is slightly more mafic, ultimately, we're talking about a, an evolved Pacific igneous rock. And we can go further still from just saying, not just saying that the um, the Archean crust was on average more felsic or uh, more mafic, but actually we can talk about the diversity 
of ignis uh, of uh, protolith exposed at surface two. So you'll notice that there's a huge amount of scatter within each time period. Now, I think you know, one way of interpreting that is that's just noise and we can ignore it. But actually, it, the alternatively, it just represents diversity of igneous rocks, and that each of these gray samples represents the, the average composition of the catchment of which it ultimately derived. So we can talk about igneous rock diversity, not just the central tendency. And this is only really powerful, uh, really possible, because we have that statistical power offered by the large um, systematic collection. In particular, I think it's interesting that if we take a sample of Archean sediments, shown here um, in uh, blue, the diversity of different samples is pretty similar to that of the present day. So whilst the central tendencies are certainly different, there's a significant overlap, which kind of, to me, says that the Archean crust is probably not that much different to the present day crust, just on average, slightly more mafic. Now, finally, we focus pretty much entirely on average process compositions, but we can actually, we can do slightly better um, because we also have that weathering term. So whilst we've been undoing the effect of weathering to get at the composition of, of the sediment, we're also interested in weathering intensity itself. So what we did here is we took all of the samples from the Phanerozoic in the FGP data set, this is 600 million years and younger, and calculated using our new method, the intensity of weathering they've experienced. And then the sort of the black curve here just represents the Gaussian smooth of all the same noisy gray point data. And this is a new way of generating a weather intensity uh, proxy curves uh, through the sedimentary record. So previously we focused only on using um, proxies hosted in carbonates like strontium isotopes or lithium isotopes or osmium isotopes. But actually in aggregate, now that we have these very large systematic databases, we can now start generating a new kind of weather intensity record, which is by using um, the central tendency of large numbers of sediment um, uh, intensity proxies. And this is yeah, only possible in aggregate once we take by use of like the, the large number theorem effectively. So this is a, a, new, a new way of generating sedimentary records. So vertically up here is high intensity and low is low intensity. And the black curve here is overlain with the red curve, which represents the oxygen isotope curve. I'm not going to speak too much about this because I'm running slightly over time already, I know. But I'm just going to draw your attention that these periods of low weather intensity here in the Silurian uh, and the Neogene, and also in the, uh, the Permian, appear to be slightly coincident with periods of glaciation. Um, so there's potentially some interesting correlations to be made about weather intensity and climate. And I think what I, uh, what's really interesting to me is that as, as our, the FTP data go through even more phases, data is collected from around the world, this record is only going to get more and more refined and improved and reliable as data is added. Uh, so just you know, to finally sum up, I, all of this is only possible from the contributions of time and data from the FTP data set and also some, my support from supervisors and collaborators. Uh, and it would be a myth not to plug uh, the two papers which these results are published in. But before that, but just in the interest of time, I'll hand back over to Eric. Uh, thanks for your time. And yeah, happy to answer any more questions after, after Eric finished. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Um, that uh, ends on a, on a perfect point for my next slide, which is uh, talking about um, uh, the, the kind of next phases of SGP. Uh, so as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, we're an open collaborative consortium. Everyone's welcome to grow uh, or to join. Uh, the only thing that, I, that, that we ask in order to join the requirement is helping us grow our data project in some way. Uh, this could be basically uh, a small amount of data, a large amount of data, um, but that kind of uh, uh, help in data acquisition and growing our data product um, is, is ultimately what we need to keep, keep moving the, the product forward. So if you're interested in joining, um, please shoot uh, either me or Una Farrell an email. Uh, we'll talk about what data you want to get in, and we'll help set you up with our standardized uh, geological context sheet, uh, which is shown here from some samples from, from Malcolm Hodgkiss. Um, 
there's a lot of fields here, a lot of things that we track, a lot of things that, as I mentioned, uh, ultimately have utility in these large scale statistical analyses. Um, a lot of them, though, do end up being uh, things that you can copy and paste or select from from pull down menus. So it's not quite as as bad as it is originally looks. Um, so please get in touch with us if you're interested in joining. We'd, we'd love to have you. Uh, very briefly, I wanted to talk about where we're going uh, moving forward um, in SGP phase two. We've been working very hard to, to change our database structure to better incorporate carbonate geochemical data uh, or kind of more generally any phase specific analysis that anyone uh, generates, we can, we can now accommodate. Um, we've also been talking about uh, incorporating biomarker data uh, into, the, uh, into the database, which kind of doesn't have any sort of um, uh, database home. Um, the big thing that we're really focusing on is, is covering the entirety of Earth history and getting more global coverage. And this is why uh, it's awesome to give a talk in the virtual Precambrian seminar uh, and hopefully reach some more people um, in this community. Uh, we're also working towards uh, being able to do instrument corrections or kind of more broadly, just making all of the methodology uh, information in the database uh, more available to, to users. Um, we've started a couple of community building activities, which I'll talk about recently. Uh, and then going forward, um, we really want to make our website uh, kind of the, uh, the place that people can go to, to access this data in the most efficient and most useful way. So as you're using the, the data set and the, the website, um, if you see bugs or anything, uh, obviously let us know. But also if you have suggestions for feedback, what would make the, what would make the website more useful, please let us know as well. Um, because we do want this to make the, the best website as possible for the community. Um, so in terms of community building, uh, we want to move beyond uh, just being a, a place for data accession and um, centralization. Uh, we're kind of trying to become uh, something of an intellectual hub for, this, for the deep time and sedimentary geochemical communities. Uh, and so we started a, a number of things to try to, to, build, to build our community. Um, one thing that we do is we, we send out abstract lists for upcoming conferences. So, uh, you know, if you're an early career researcher and you would like your talk at Goldschmidt or GSA to be advertised to everyone within the group, um, you know, this is kind of a, a little carrot uh, that would be, uh, be useful in terms of joining SGP. We also try to highlight people uh, that have added a, a bunch of new data in the SGP data entry all-stars area of our, of our promotional website. Um, this hasn't happened for a couple of years, but we have held and, and will continue to plan to hold uh, planning and social meetings at Goldschmidt and GSA, uh, both to talk about um, a little bit of SGP business, but also to provide kind of just a, an intellectual space for people interested in deep time and sedimentary geochemistry to gather and, and discuss. Uh, we're next year gonna be holding regular group calls, probably about four times a year. Uh, discussing our progress with respect to phase two and our plans for analyzing that data, how people can get involved in that data, and then also having a little bit of a, of a talk uh, by early career speakers, um, such as you saw from, from Alex and Rich actually talking about data analysis. Uh, and then finally, uh, we've started a, a short course, short series of short courses on geochemical proxies. Uh, we call these the SGP proxy primer series, and they're both live uh, so you can ask questions and also curated on our, on our YouTube channel. Uh, and the idea here was to have a series of open and accessible talks um, that would be, that would kind of allow everyone in the field, whether you're a geochemist, uh, but also if you're a stratigrapher or a paleontologist uh, or a tectonicist or whatever, to kind of get on board and understand at an accessible level, the various geochemical proxies that we use in the deep time record. So, we already had a great talk by Dr. Ava Stoiken on nitrogen isotopes. Uh, and then coming up um, later in October, Alan Rooney uh, will be giving us a hopefully gentle introduction to rhenium osmium geochronology and, and osmium isotopes. Uh, so just to conclude, um, we hope everyone will want to be in, involved. Uh, as we said, this is an open collaborative uh, consortium. So if you're interested in being involved, please get in touch with us. Also, uh, if you know colleagues or lab members that, that would be interested, uh, please let them know what uh, uh, as well. Uh, and then finally, start thinking ahead to how you might want to use uh, a data set that covers all lithologies and all of Earth history, which is what, what we're hoping to, to accomplish in phase two in order to, to answer uh, 
any range of questions in earth history. And what I really like about, uh, you know, the contrast, you know, Rich's talk is something that my lab has been uh, concerned about for a long time. How, how has the redox state of the oceans changed through time? But then Alex's talk was on a completely different use having to do with, you know, original uh, composition of the continental crust, something that I never even considered when we started the SGP project. And so, uh, you know, thinking of all of the different ways that we can use this data set when it's together, um, at this point, it will be great. And with that, uh, we'd love to take questions. Um, yeah, we will uh, definitely, if you, if you want to shout out who your question is for, um, that'd be great. All right, great. Thanks to the three of you. You all did great. Um, we, uh, we'll start getting in a bunch of questions. We already have one for, uh, for Rich here um, from Lee Comp, and I'll read it out loud. Um, he prefaces with, sorry, I may have missed it, but how might terrestrial organic carbon burial in the later Proterozoic and remaining Phanerozoic factor into the apparent Phanerozoic atmosphere PO2 increase? And uh, I might just clarify, I meant uh, later Paleozoic, sorry. Right. With the PZ. Oh, okay. oh, PZ. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, Paleozoic. Whoops. Yeah. Um, well, thanks, Lee. That's a great point. I don't think you did miss it. Um, one of, to, to be clear, none of our models have a, like a terrestrial carbon burial component. And that's, um, that's clearly kind of a, a caveat to some of what we've done here. We've focused entirely on, on marine organic carbon burial. Um, I guess my, the, my sort of intuitive reaction would be that, increased terrestrial organic carbon burial through the evolution of land plants and the evolution of forests would contribute to a, like some additional PO2 increase around a similar time to that Devonian increase that we're, we're reconstructing. Um, but I'd also kind of flag that that's, that's why at the moment we've kind of, we've highlighted these three broad phases of, of atmospheric O2 and productivity rather than trying to get a, a time dependent model um, based on these because there are there are processes that right now um, our modeling and, and statistical analyses aren't capturing. Yeah, just you know be, it be interesting to pursue that a little bit you know going back to Berner and Canfield that was their explanation for a, you know a, a mid Phanerozoic increase in atmospheric O2 and coal abundance curves look this way. And so there may be some aspects of that though, that you could mine this really valuable new database and, and ever improving database for to look at that, you know, that terrestrial component, you know, burial of terrigenous organic material, both in the, in, in the terrestrial environment, but also in the marine environment as well. And maybe the biomarkers could, could help there. But, um, but yeah, it, it's, a, it's a permanent change in you know, an an additional source of O2 to the atmosphere associated with the burial of a new, uh, you know, source of organic material that waxes and wanes for sure in terms of you know coal, but um, but is a new important part of the global carbon cycle. Right. Yeah. Totally. Thank you. That's a that's a great point um, and definitely an exciting avenue to pursue. All right. Looks like we have a question from Jing Jun. Jing Jun Liu. Hi, uh, Rich. Uh, I have two questions for you. Um, first one is about whether you have, you know, tested the whether you um, have shown the uh, the your on 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 sorry before we before you bootstrap the sample. Did you see like um, like the distribution halfly tilted towards the Neoproterozoic or Phanerozoic boundary? Because if the if the distribution is exponentially unbounded, then then when you use bootstrap, you are not converged to the same mean each time, right? Sorry, I missed the very last bit of what you said. Would you be willing to repeat it? Uh, so one of the promises of using bootstrap is that the distribution is not halfly tilted, meaning the tilt is not exponentially uh, uh, bounded. But if that's the case, you will not converge to the same mean each time. But since for me, uh, for the time period you're looking at, the, the distribution is very happily tilted to the 
uh, to the uh, Proterozoic to the Phenozoic boundary, right? I'm not sure if you, right. if you test it before you actually <clears throat> run the resample. So they, we definitely don't have normally distributed data. That's, that's, that's kind of one of the issues that we do face where, for instance, in a lot of those earlier compilations, we tend to run, as a community, we've tended to run lines kind of through the maxima of, of the data compilations that we have. Um, I guess that means that we haven't, haven't perfectly dealt with that, that issue of, of having skewed data. The one way that we've, we've tried to deal with, with, say, not reproducing the same mean every single time is, is through our bootstrapping approach and to, to run this bootstrap you know, 10,000 times or yeah, 10,000 times and see, look at the distribution of means that we recover. And for instance, in the, around 800 million years ago, we see much, um, much where people have suggested that atmospheric oxygen might have increased. We see much broader um, distributions of elements like molybdenum um, and perhaps a less clear estimate of central tendency with fewer samples. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting point. Thanks. We'll um we'll think about that further for sure. Great. Right. You know, I always you know Noah is my advisor. We always have this debate <laughs> over whether we should use proper statistical method. But we never really reach agreement. But yeah, I'm happy to see a follow up. And my my next question is to the uh, uh, the phosphorus and uh, using Gini and the canops. Uh, I'm not sure how how the two was coupled because. Uh, the sample was taken in 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 the based on modern geography. Uh, when you show the data uh, collections, uh, have you kind of you know reconstructed that into say the the, the paleo geography, and then use the like the three D genie? Uh, but even that's the case, I, was, I still get confused because the canops is a one D model, right? Uh, right? How how you couple the two? So this is, <laughs> thanks for asking this question. It's difficult to get through all these models in a short talk. Um, so at the moment, we are not directly interfacing any of our geochemical data with the models in a, in a spatial sense. We're actually, we're really using model outputs to interface with the kinds of, the kinds of things that people are often interested in. So we're, for instance, the genie outputs here, we're just summarizing those genie simulations to estimate the, the sync extents that go into the molybdenum uranium mass balance model. Um, and for the CANOPS model, we're really just summarizing CANOPS results that Devon Cole produced, but for those same scenarios that we see in the genie model. I think a really exciting future avenue that I'm excited to use this data for would be to start thinking about this problem in a more spatially explicit sense. And then absolutely you could start um, linking SGP data to more regional um, paleoceanographic trends that you might predict using Gini. Um, we still end up with this issue with say CANOPS not being as spatially complex as Gini where we do want to understand carbon cycling at longer timescales than conventionally um, intermediate complexity like three D models, like Genia Runner, um, but but people are doing exciting things on that as well, as I'm sure you're aware. So there, I think there are a lot of exciting ways to interface these models going forwards, and this this likely won't be the final word on that. Yeah, one increment at a time. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. <laughs> yeah absolutely. All right, we at the moment don't have any questions popped up. Um, Maybe I have a couple of questions for Alex, but may, maybe Eric also can help. Uh, first one, uh, sort of, these are all the rocks, and obviously we went through various diagenesis metamorphism. Uh, so is uh, post-deposition alteration uh, would be listed as a residual factor in your, in your equation? Uh, sort of how do you address post-deposition alteration? And second question, um, I, I did work myself on compiling etheric ferrous data for shales. And one 
question I was always struggle like at what point you sort of uh, accept what your compilation represent sort of ultimate reality and sort of how do you test with let's say one year ago you had 3000 samples and now you have 6000 samples so where when do you feel comfortable that you approach uh, some uh, sort of close to a true number of samples to address question i i guess maybe i'll take the first question and then I think the second one seems more appropriate for eric um to answer so regarding diagenesis, that's definitely something which we consider we were very concerned about and we really wanted to work out whether we were robust to it. So our feeling is actually, as you say, it comes out as a residual term in our model. So obviously the further you get away from the model plane, the less reliable that interpretation is going to be because you don't necessarily know. You want to be keep your residuals as small as possible. Interestingly, when you look at the residuals for the larger chemical data sets, there is a structure within them, which is kind of interesting because it suggests it's not just sort of a random process. In particular, we see really strong um, anti-correlation between residual sodium and calcium, which is pretty, um, anyway, if you, it's sort of intuitively and also if you model it, that is pretty strongly suggestive of sodium cation, sodium calcium exchange because if you, you, know, you add in sodium and you just replace it with calcium, and if you just model that effect, that's exactly what you'd expect to see. So the largest variability in our residuals is actually sodium-calcium exchange. And what we've done is we just filtered out samples which are like beyond a, uh, a certain threshold away from the plane and just removed them from our data set through time. So on that sort of just purely statistical level, we think we're at least minimizing these effects. Secondly, we also uh, think that because we're taking this aggregate mod, this aggregate tendency, central tendency for both uh, weathering and provenance, we think that effectively any variability from this uh, variable diagenetic effects is probably averaged out unless there is some sort of systematic variability, systematic effect going on. So if we have only addition or removal of sodium and calcium, diagenetically, that could potentially bias our results. But if it's on aggregate, that motion within the sediment, within the sediment pile is just going to be averaged out. So on these long time scales, we think it's not so much of an issue. That being said, if you were to, start to apply this, this, um, this approach to something on a much shorter geographical and temporal time scale, the magnitude of those effects relative to the aggregate um, variability might be more significant. So it's only because we're taking these sort of large central tendency averages that it probably sort of comes out in the wash. What about potassium? Do you see large variability in potassium? Not on nearly the same scale as sodium and calcium. So we've actually looked even at, um, and to be fair, that it matches what we see with cation exchange um, in the modern day. So if you look at the condition of sediments, in the sort of the Brahma Putra and then in suspended sediments offshore, they have the same, that you can see that the sodium and calcium have completely exchanged, but the potassium, whilst it, you can observe that it has changed, the magnitude of the effect is much, much smaller. And that reflects kind of what we saw as well. Uh, cool. So Andre, I'll take on your question, which is, which is like a, just such a great question um, and brings up so many, so many things to talk about. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how we've approached things, um, but some of the, the answers to the questions that you raised are things that should should really be a community discussion of kind of what are the things that, that kind of I brought up at the start of the talk, what are the things that we need to code into these databases as a community in order to account for the processes that we think are important. Um, and so in our database with respect to alteration, uh, we do have people put in uh, what we term metamorphic grade, uh, which is a relatively, it's better information than, you know, you fall into these categories, it's better information than anyone else has, but it's still not, uh, uh, you know, the, the absolute best thing you would want. And so that's kind of a tripartite division between diagenetic zone, uh, zone, and epizone um, metamorphism or, or maturation. 
Um, of course, with that, uh, people that work on relatively younger sediments or uh, organic geochemistry all get mad because the, the diagenetic zone in incorporates both under mature and, and post mature samples. Um, so we include that. We include whether it's from core or outcrop, and we include um, uh, latitude and longitude. And so together, those things can give you some sense of the, the metamorphic conditions the sample has experienced and the kind of post depositional or alteration that it's experienced. So if it's an outcrop, you know, it could be from a desert uh, or from like a, a high northerly latitude, for instance, uh, that hasn't experienced uh, as much oxidative weather. Um, how you then incorporate those is, is another question. Uh, you can either explicitly exclude samples or you can take the approach that, that Rich did in his database, uh, kind of more, uh, or his analysis, kind of a more statistical learning approach uh, where you're actually being agnostic with respect to the, to the importance of each of these variable categories and, and information and just kind of feeding it all into the hopper uh, and allowing the, the statistical learning approach to, to figure out the relationships between the variables and which ones are important. Um, so that's what's in the database that's right now. Um, we also incorporate various proxies, uh, things like rocky eval data or vitronite reflectance data. Uh, you could imagine um, potentially including something like metamorphic, some metamorphic data, although we don't include that at the moment. Um, I would love to have more discussions with people, especially as we start moving back to, to, to older and older time scales where, where rocks are more and more messed up on average uh, about the things that would be useful to, to code into the database in order to, to kind of screen out or account for these, um, for these biases. With respect to the other question about how many samples is enough, uh, which, is, which is, you know, a tough one, uh, I would say, a, at first glance, uh, it's an easy answer because we're, I would say we're nowhere near getting as good a good a sampling of the ancient Earth through time in terms of time and paleogeography as as we would want to infer these trends. Um, but moving on to a to a more precise answer is difficult. Uh, you can do something called power analysis. Uh, I've actually never seen it done in sedimentary geochemistry, um, but you can you can say what is the predicted effect size. Uh, and then how many samples do I need in order to resolve that effect size? However, in order to do that, of course, you actually have to know what the effect size is that you're looking at, which is generally the, the, the thing we're trying to get at in the first place. And so it's, it's a little bit circular. Um, you can play those games or you can play games looking at, uh, as we've added data through time, are we kind of approaching an, an asymptote of, of results, um, which would be a, an interesting thing to look at. Uh, complicating all that, of course, is, is the fact that we're, we're dealing with a heavily biased record in terms of both what, what is available in the geological record and what we've sampled uh, through uh, geological time. So of course, uh, black shale geochemists always go to the, uh, to the juiciest black shales. And so um, you know, presumably the, the first samples that were, that were analyzed are gonna be the, the most organic rich samples. Um, and this is again where I think taking the taking the approach from paleobiology of trying to to think through all of these different both geological and sociological biases uh, and try to pull out the the signal from the record um, is the way that we need to be moving uh, as a field. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so have a compile and similar database for iron formations, we at some point started to realize most most of samples come from drill core and drill core largely drilled by iron for comp mining companies, which uh, in areas where iron formation was upgraded to iron ore. And so you kind of by definition bias towards sampling uh, areas that were affected by alteration. And yeah, that that is an awesome an awesome point, an awesome example. I mean, and that's why I think you know when I think about SGP, um, you know, there's there are other geochemical databases and so forth. There are people compiling geochemical data. Um, Earthchem, for instance, uh, compiles geochemical data. 
what EarthCam doesn't provide is an intellectual platform for people to discuss these issues and discussing analyzing the data. And that's what I hope that we can move towards in SGP is not just building this big database, but talking, you know, talking together about all of these different problems that arise in actually analyzing the data. Thanks. Uh, I have a question if everyone still has time. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm working on uh, biomarkers to the Silurian period, um, and I'm really interested in the rise of uh, vascular plants, um, terrestrial plants. Um, my question is for Eric and Rich um, about the changing redox to the, the Paleozoic. Um, one thing that I think has a big effect possibly is uh, thermohaline circulation and kind of the, Eric was getting at like kind of the regionality of these uh, data sets. Um, do you, when you look at your genie models, have you played around with changes in ocean circulation and how this might affect redox through the Paleozoic? And then, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'll start out with that. Yes. So the, the, the concise answer is yes. I've tried a couple of different um, like continental configurations through the time interval I've been working on. And I've also tried a couple of different climate states and biological pump strengths. And the, the like macro scale results um, hold true pretty much either way. I think the, like, the more difficult next step, um, kind of calling on one of the previous questions is, is dealing with with the paleoceanographic biases in the regions that we're sampling and the places that we find black shale. Um, I think that's a really exciting avenue for future work that, that models like Genie are, are well primed for. Um, and we are increasingly getting, um, Alexandra Paul's been doing some awesome work um, looking at changes in continental configuration through time, through the whole Phanerozoic. Um, so I think, I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunities um moving forwards to to link um paleoceanography to the specific sample locations we have more directly um it i think i think whether or not it it really matters probably depends upon the scale that you're you're interested in um and 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 working out how much computational power you need to use to answer a given question is, is another one of those tough tough questions Great, thanks. Um, if I can just like add one comment, I think one period that's really interesting is the Silurian period. You have this high density of carbon excursions, positive carbon excursions, also during this period of uh, rise in terrestrial plants. I think it'd be really interesting to see kind of change the. It's been proposed that changes in ocean circulation have caused like these these positive isotope excursions, but I think it'd be interesting to test changes with these excursions with the rise of terrestrial plants. Um, and there's also interesting changing redox patterns that I think would be really cool with some of the stuff you've worked on, uh, Rich. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And it's one of those things where kind of like like the, the time scale issue I was talking about with not picking up transient changes in neoproterozoic common cycling, we we see very much a Silurian Devonian change rather than capturing some of those based upon the carbon isotope excursions of the Silurian, we might expect the Silurian to be relatively unstable, but here we're smoothing a lot of that out. So digging in, digging into um, time periods like Silurian, I think is a really, really cool thing to be doing. Yeah, I agree. I think the Silurian needs more love. <laughs> I, I think it's gonna, I think it's getting it. It's gonna get it. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I worked on the Neoproterozoic for for a long time, and I still do, obviously. And for a long time, I I like I couldn't understand why people would work in the the Phanerozoic because I thought the Proterozoic was just so cool. And then I started working in the uh, the early Paleozoic through that Road River Group project, and oh, it's just so cool. And in addition to things you inter you mentioned, there's also a kind of a resurgence of stromatolites in the Solarian. Um, yeah, a whole bunch of interesting things. Um, and, and you can also tell time, which is a nice feature having worked in the Precambrian much of my life. Uh, you can, you can correlate between continents on a million year time scale, um, which is, which is 
you know, pretty cool. So, so I guess um, I, you know, going along with what was just brought up, I've been doing some thinking about running some models for um, for Silorian as well with the CG model. I'm sort of thinking how what your experiences have been thinking about constraining stuff like atmospheric redox with you know the big database you guys have um because i mean i i i'm sitting around doing all this literature review trying to figure out what numbers should i be using um do you guys find that your your database seems to be in agreement with published data um would it what do you think uh, that's a great question. I mean, that, but you're also kind of getting at the, I guess, kind of the, the fundamental issue of, of reconstructing atmospheric oxygen, which is that most of our records are actually of marine redox and not directly atmospheric oxygen. So, of course, in the, you know, in the GOE, you have direct record, you know, putatively direct, direct relatively direct records of atmospheric oxygen through the, through the uh, MIF-S record. Um, but then you're just kind of left with records of, of marine redox generally, which are uh, a very imperfect reflection of atmospheric oxygen uh, in the sense that you have all of marine biogeochemistry being imprinted on them. So uh, my reading of the, of the, the bulk sedimentary geochemical record uh, is that um, the, the early Paleozoic probably was uh, a time of lower atmospheric oxygen compared to the later Paleozoic and, and like, well, I mean, once you get into the charcoal record, you're, you're essentially, you know, you have a, a certain floor to your atmospheric oxygen. Um, I think it's consistent with, uh, with lower atmospheric oxygen in the early Paleozoic, but I, you know, it is, it is a, a tough thing tough thing to connect those records. Uh, Rich, I don't know if you wanted to add anything more along those lines. Yeah, just to, I mean, you can always, you can always borrow from, from, uh, uh, from long-term um, carbon cycling models to, to get estimates that you can plug into models like Genie, but they're also very difficult to, to kind of ground truth. Um, I think, I think the thing that I've found trying to run early Paleozoic simulations is that really above knowing the floor set by the char charcoal record, when we're talking about, you know, the Silurian and the Devonian, it does get really difficult. The nice thing about Genie is you can run more than more than one simulation, but you then do, yeah. you kind of get into this situation where you have so many models that you need to kind of then see the, the, the trees for the forest kind of thing. Um, and I think, I think planning those experiments out is is the way to go have an idea of of how much uncertainty you think you're going to be able to quantify in a figure or a or a paper before before you generate 400 gene models and don't know what to do with them yeah i might reach out to you then because i've got a couple of concepts that i need to think a lot more before i uh really get on so yeah for sure i'll be at gsa as well okay cool So just uh, to follow on uh, discussion with Alex, uh, I was wondering uh, uh, if uh, for potassium would be any change related to appearance of terrestrial vegetation, but it seems like from what you already said, uh, you don't see much of a change in potassium content for time, especially for the Phanerozoic. So we do, so Phanerozoic, we do, we do, so the potassium is quite a diagnostic in terms of protolith we find. So different elements are like responsive to different processes. So they, the point is that we, you sort of deconvolve them all together, but uh, generally some elements are particularly diagnostic and potassium, whilst it's modified by weathering, it's quite, in general, is fairly heavily weighted parallel to the, like the, the provenance direction. So the changes we see are largely to do with um, on like billion year time scales to do with changing protolith composition. But it is certainly related to do with, to, it is also responsive to weathering. So it is, you, it, the, the trends which we see over the Phanerozoic will also be to do with changes in potassium. And we do see systematic changes subsequent 
to the evolution of land plants. So I might just pull up one figure again quickly. Um, so we see this sort of, there is no step change after land plants, which kind of is what you would imagine, because if, that, if there is a sort of step change in weather intensity, you've just sunk a whole bunch of carbon and it's not coming back again. So that would pretty, that's sort of unlikely to, to occur. Instead, you know, once the um, evolution of land plants really sort of kicks off at the end Silurian, we do see this sort of you know, sharp increase in weathering intensity. And uh, I kind of have treated this paper as very much like a producing a data product as opposed to necess or like a, an interpretation um, of weather intensity as opposed to trying to put sort of biological or uh, system interpretations on this. But what we observe is this sort of step change in intensity following the land plants of evolution. Um, which does, you know, return uh, later on at the Paleozoic. So part of that might be driven by potassium, but it's, it's hard to, and in fact, it's sort of the, the point of our approach is that no individual element is doing all the, all the changing on its own. Uh, and sorry, Alex, if I can just jump in with one other thing there um, with that diagram. Uh, we, we mentioned this in the paper, but uh, the SGP data database, uh, of course, has great data from a bunch of different regions through the Paleozoic. Uh, but as you get even towards the later parts of the Paleozoic, the Permian and then the Mesozoic and Cenozoic, uh, all the data there is primarily North American. Um, so there will be that regional signal um, kind of superimposed there. Um, so I, I feel like that caveat is important when discussing kind of whether there's a, a to what extent there's a step change uh, at that origin of plants. Definitely. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think that's what's so interesting because this is very much such an aggregate trend as more and more data appears and is added in. Hopefully something, you know, global signals begin to converge, um, which is something to look forward to, hopefully.